You've got four rentals yep. across commercial and residential. Yeah, half and half split, yeah. Half and half split. You've already built a passive income after expenses of $13,000 yep. a year yep. with current interest rates, correct? Correct, correct, yep. Mate, look, according to, to Westpac, the average 18 to 24-year-old has something like 2000 or not something like, it has mm-hmm. $2,828 in savings. Mm-hmm. Talk to me about your savings habits and getting the deposits together to actually start this portfolio. I think it's fair to start from the first one then. So yep. first one, we're at what, 18? So from 14 to 18, saved 60K in total. Mm-hmm. First one, I had a deposit of 49,000, just about, maybe a couple of dollars off. Yep. And then that one was from that 60, 49, take that off. I then had some residual left over. Some of that was used for a buffer, just for common expenses, like you have interest coming out each month and whatever. And then from that, I had about 20 save. So saved another 10, bought the next one for 26. And that was with LMI included. So I used my work income to boost those savings up. And I never took the profit from those rentals. Those have just been in there building up. Can we rewind a little bit? Yeah. First rental, 49K. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you'd saved. Uh, that's by the age of 18. Correct. Oh, I had 60 saved and then spent 49 for the first one, yeah. Okay, that's what I want to dig down into. Yeah. So h- how the hell are you saving $60,000 as an 18-year-old? How many hours are you doing? Oh, like 38, 40, depends. We can push it heaps higher. And so you, you quit school? and, and No, so- no, no. So full-time school, full-time work. So that was from 14, casual, and then I did my cert three in retail services. That was three McDonald's. And then you get paid to do that as well, but you go to part-time to do it. And so I had been working, you know, full-time hours still in that time. And then came casual again, did full-time hours still again. And then I've done pretty much full-time hours up until this date as well, pretty much. Yeah, still. Yeah. Where'd the work ethic come from? Like mum and dad the same or how, how did this come about? They're definitely good work ethic. I just, I think I push it a bit further as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I like working, so I want to keep working as well. And I enjoy what I do. And I've got a really good saving and budgeting skills to just throw that money straight into houses now. But back then, like I wanted to see the compound interest growth and just see the interest come back into those accounts every month and get higher and higher and higher. So that was a little goal as well. Talk, talk to me about this. So you started saving at what, what age then? 14? 14, yep, yep. 14, okay. And and how much of your wage are you actually putting away? Like by the sounds of it, almost all of it? Yeah, pr- practically at 14, practically all of it. Yeah, that'd have been like $5. On the first paycheck, I probably spent a little bit. But the second one, it would probably be all of it, yeah. How'd you go, like, fitting in with friends and everyone? They're, they're all working. Well, and 15 and 14 is pretty cheap. So <laughs> easy living if you're I, not doing anything too expensive. I guess you're only spending money on the canteen if you really want to. Yeah, and I didn't. So yeah. I saved it all. <laughs> I had lunch from mum from, for school and it was easy. And work, you get half price if I was going to have anything there. Or you get a free meal. Like, you know, be easy. Okay, all right. Yeah. And and so mum mum's a pretty hard worker by the yeah, sounds yep, of things. Yep, yep. And from what you so she I... used to do Balfour's and she was in product development in that. Okay. She's like helped make the pizza pie and um well back when they had the I think it was ashes or something, they did like a mushy pea pie and a yeah. ketchup pie or whatever. She helped do that with one of her colleagues there. Mate, pizza pie. We should have a photo yeah, of it, our on the wall. <laughs> pizza here. and property, <laughs> there's a pie picture, not a pizza anymore. Yeah. No, that's funny, yeah. No, so she left that, became stay at home mum full time. And yep. then that, because she's had three kids, myself, my younger brother by about 13 months and then eight years younger, my sister. And so, they, you know, that's taken up most of that time now. So mum's had a very hard work ethic beforehand, oh, yeah, yeah. very accomplished by the sounds yeah, of things. Yeah. Uh, now she's at home, she's raising the kids. Yep. She's still quite an influence on, on your life. Oh, for sure, yeah. And yeah. you've told me she even comes to Opens with you, like helps you. Oh, yeah, for the first two, yeah, yeah. Because we um, flew down to where we bought them. Oh, no, sorry, the first one we didn't fly down. That was a family holiday. Okay. We went there, but it was for, the family holiday was like, Two parts. It was the holiday because we we're bringing everyone with us. Mm-hmm. We we're actually going there just to look at the houses. So <laughs> I was okay. the reason we had a family holiday. <laughs> okay. <It's> a, <laughs> the second one, we actually flew down for my, it was just me and her. So everyone's getting involved. Okay. T- talk to me more about, because I feel like we've taken us off topic a little bit yeah. more. I, I, I really want to dig deep into these savings habits. Mm-hmm. So you, you get paid. Yep. Tuesday, Wednesday, whenever it is. Yeah, yep. Tuesday, yep. But the money hits your account. Mm-hmm. What happens then? Oh, divide. So I know all the expenses off the back of my head, but when I first worked it out with mum, that was when I was 14. So very much, I could do it myself now, yeah. but back then I'd use her and we worked out. So say like registration, insurance, license, all that, not mm-hmm. a problem when you're 14, but you know, when I was 16, it became a problem because I had a car then Yeah. and you know, you divide that by 52. So the whole total expense for the year, divide 52, put that away in a separate account. It now becomes that account's money. 
So I never touch it. So you'd look at it and go, okay, Red Joe's going to cost me 700 bucks. So I put away $16 a week or whatever That's it is. That's literally it, yeah. So I put 22 and 8 cents into a separate account every week and direct debits come out of that and whatever. But it never goes below zero, ever. It'll always ex- it'll exceed it. Probably It'll go like to where it needs to go, a little buffer as well. So like maybe 2 or $3. Yep. That way it's never, if there's an increase in price or whatever, I don't have to worry about it. And mum taught you this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's how she does hers as well. Hers is a bit more old school, you know, paper-based. I use an Excel spreadsheet because it's easier. Okay. Yeah. All right. So mum's given you these savings habits. Mm. You've you've chosen to implement them. Yeah, for sure. Because I'm sure plenty of people when they're 14 get taught stuff. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean they actually run with it. Now, talk to me a little bit about the the first interest that you got paid because it sounds like that was one of the catalysts for you. (laughs) For sure. It was compound interest that just got me hooked. It was my first love, you know. I love love girls, but <laughs> <laughs> compound interest is great. You know, you can't break up with compound interest. So. <laughs> but um it's, it's a giving relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All yeah. giving. Um <laughs> but yeah. Um first one I think it was about ten K or five K. I had like ten dollars in interest that month and it was wicked. Like, you know, I was fourteen and made ten dollars. It was like my hourly re- weight oh wage. Actually you would have been about ten bucks an hour then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. About ten bucks an hour. And that was what I got in a month. So I worked an hour without working an hour. So okay. That was a catalytic moment for me. And and so this then changed the way that you started looking at money. It wasn't just about saving it. It was like, how can money actually start working for Oh, yeah. Well, making money work for me and make it work bloody hard too. Okay. And so why property then? Why not crypto? Why not shares? Like, how'd you get into well, it? Well, I dabbled in shares a little bit. Mm-hmm. So that was when I was 18. We bought a couple of shares, my mate and I in biology class. Okay. <laughs> that was do? actually in the class. Yeah. yeah. The <laughs> teacher watched us do it. It was... But yeah, um, it was only a small amount and then I dabbled a little bit more and it wasn't much money at all, really, less than 10 grand. And then maybe closer to five-ish. Hold on, so you're putting 10 grand into shares? Yeah, roundabouts, yeah. In, in biology the class? and how Not in biology. In biology, we only put like 500 because we we're just dabbling then. Right, okay. And then I put more than my mate did. Yep. And that was later. It was like over a couple of years, maybe two years I did that. Now, how old are you at this stage? Oh, 18 going to 20, no, no, 19 and a half. I would have stopped by then. Okay, so yeah. you started, what, around 17 then, if you did it for about two years? Well, shares you can only buy when you're 18, so yeah, oh, yeah, it would have course. gone from 18 to 19 and a half, so a year and a half, right. about I'll, 10K in that time. I wasn't sure if you had some kind of a, a trust set up nah, or anything nah. like that. Okay, so you bought some shares, they and they did poorly? Well, well? S- half did poorly, half did really well. Sold the sold all, almost all of them except one, and yep. that one's still going well. Does I have a dividend reinvestment plan for that one, so compound interest pretty much again. And I'm just leaving that in the background, not doing anything with it. Just sits there. Yeah, it's not exciting. But okay. it's good. It's just not, you know, as fun as property. I like property way better. And then what lit the spark with property? Well, shares weren't giving me the return I wanted. When you sell shares, you got to pay CGT and all that. So, you know, there's a lot. And property has purchase costs and selling costs that are quite extraordinary. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you can control when that is. And dividends, you can, you can sort of see when that's going to happen. But, you know, rents every month. You know that's going to happen every month. So there's a frequency I like in that. Mm-hmm. And that's better for passive income. How'd you find it? Like, was it a book you picked up, a podcast, a Well, a I read so many books. Um, it'd be hard to pick one that I, you know, chose because I read Barefoot Investor pretty early on. Yep. That was, I actually stole it off my mum, actually. Um, I read that. <laughs> she got like two, three chapters in and I took over, read the rest of it before her because I'm really fast with reading. Yeah, okay. So I, and then like I got a scholarship from school as well that was like STEM stuff. And then we- Some sum- STEM stuff? Yeah, like science, technology, engineering, maths and stuff. Okay. And somehow- um, the support like teacher who ran that, he somehow made it so we could funnel some of that into finance books by the end. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know how we did it. I think maybe mathematics just got in there somehow and we're like, okay, cool. I, I guess numbers. I can see how that fits, yeah. Yeah, so we bought a bunch of books and then I started reading those. And what, what ones come to mind when you think about well, that? Well, there was um, Lloyd Edge's Buy Now and um, Positive mm-hmm. Cash Flow, I think it was, something like that. Yep. Those were quite catalytic for a lot of what I've done. Yep. I don't think I read them right at the start. I think the ones I read right at the start were probably Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Closer to when I was 18 mm-hmm. and like cash flow quadrant sort of stuff like that. Sort of thinking in those different mindsets, more mindset books back then, I think. And I guess that's what I'm trying to unpack. Like you're not born this way. No, this, no, definitely not. So, and, and mum and dad aren't investors. No. Um, sounds like mum's an influence. Yeah, for sure. But yeah. it's not like she's got 20 properties going, hey, I'll, no, I'll go got, you the way. she's got the home, that's it. She's got yeah. the home. Okay. So is there a, a, a moment where you're like, I'm not happy with this. Like I want life to be better and like you're seeking an answer. Oh, for sure. Like I want generational wealth. I want to be able to retire my mum. Yeah. And then, you know, I want to be able to give to my, you know, future potential kids. You know, I don't want to be able to give it, hand it to them with no work. Yeah. But I want it to be able to be there so I can spend time with them 
feel like a lot of people spend a lot of their time working and not a lot of time with their kids. Mm. And that's from my own experience, not necessarily my stepdad or my mum, but more my biological dad, right? Mm -hmm. Like he was far out from the family a little bit. But, you know, I see that and I'm like, well, cool. If I didn't, if he didn't have to work and he wasn't, you know, far away or whatever, I could spend a hell of a lot of time with my kids, enjoy their lives and enjoy my life a lot more. Not to say that I don't enjoy working, but have freedom to choose what I'm doing. That's the important part for me, the choice. And I guess that's what I'm I'm trying to uncover because like this this isn't normal. Mm. Like you you have a head on your shoulders of like a 40 year old. Like you you're you've got a lot of wisdom, mate. You really <laughs> yeah, do. Yeah. And I'm sure your mum is incredibly proud of you. And I'm trying to find out like I guess why mm. where that's come from because I think I'm I'm digging deeper into this because if if there's something that can I guess help other people that are looking at this going why aren't I as organized as this 21-year-old <laughs> dude that's working at Macca's? I'm ambitious. I'll give it that. Maybe I want to succeed. I think that's maybe partially it. Like, I just have a drive to do really bloody well. I've done a lot of things to build that up, so I have the skills for it. I think being able to manage people at work, that helps. So when I manage my portfolio, mm-hmm. you know, I have the confidence to do that because I've done both now. So I'm quite confident with both. You're very confident with it. Yeah. Okay. Talk to me about finding the the first property. So first property, we... Oh, I started looking at uh, my Excel spreadsheets and all that, and mm-hmm. I wanted to find out how to make – it's all well and good to buy something. That's easy. No worries. But then to be able to budget and keep it and not sell it because that was the risk when I was 18 is that I wasn't going to be able to service the property and keep it in my name. I might have to sell it or whatever. And the selling costs are huge, and I don't want to have you know a big debt or whatever. So I looked at my finance sheets. That's what I call them, finance sheets. It's just easier. <laughs> Because they're all on Google Sheets too. I use the free version and it saves automatically. So. <laughs> of course. Forever the bargain. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so what I do is I'd, um, I've looked at my first ones. I had about 10 spreadsheets. Mm-hmm. Each of them had a rental schedule on, which I had learned from, because I did voluntary work experience in year 12 as an accountant, mm-hmm. which I got a job from as well. So I actually worked two jobs in that year 12 time. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And then that, well, that wasn't full time. That was more part time hours in that one. So it was easy to manage, but still like a 13 hour day sometimes. It was Cheeky. And, and as an, a 17, 18 year old? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. All right, and, and what did they teach you? So rental schedules. Like when you get a tax return and you have properties, you do a rental schedule and you yep. put in all your income and you know gross expenses and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. So I use that same template and put that onto my um, Excel spreadsheets. Mm-hmm. And then I worked out just theoretical numbers, right? Like I'd look on a listing, see what their potential rent is or what they actually were paying as a tenant times up 52 or a month, whatever it was they saying. Mm-hmm. You allow for any kind of vacancy or anything like that? Well, yeah, I think in those first couple ones, I did allow for vacancy. I think I took like two grand off or something, whatever it was. Like I took a month off. Okay. Assume they're gone for a month. Yep. But, um, and then you'd include those expenses like relisting and whatever. Then I went down through that, found 1% rental yields, and I worked that all the way up through to 10% rental yields, and then took the expenses in that as well. So I had, say, one with really high income. So this is before you bought anything? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like feasibility, basically. Yep. Like how could I, this was before I purchased anything or even started looking because okay. I needed to know like the, from the foundation up, holding the properties, it's not really a, you know, buying it game. It's more holding it and keeping it when you want to sell it, if you want to sell it. Completely agree. Yeah. You know, you could buy it and then lose it this next day because your serviceability has just gone down the drain or whatever. And so where'd you learn that? I re- read a couple books. I think definitely in one of them, I remember like a, it was almost like a Maslow's hierarchy sort of thing, like yeah. pyramid. Mm-hmm. And at the top was like, the house, next one down was street, next one suburb, and then I don't know, state and then country. Mm-hmm. And so you'd work down, you know, you'd pinpoint where you want to go. Yep. But in that as well, it had like cash flow and budgeting and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So financial skills in there as well. And so I worked backwards from that. I didn't follow it to the letter, but I definitely like, I liked it. I like the concept. I think I meant more so where'd you learn that if you can't hold it, it doesn't really matter. Because again, a lot of people uh, make that mistake and think. That's just me. Because I, it's not a number of properties I want. I want quality assets. Yeah. But, you know, if I can't hold on to them, what's the point in getting them? It's just going to cost me money. Okay. Yeah. Like I'll sell them and, oops, <laughs> lost, a lot of, lost lots of money. Now it's not cool. And so working out all of these different yields yeah. helped you make a choice of a yield that you needed to, to hit. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I chose 8% yield because that's where I had a reasonable amount of profit and I could see properties I could get with that. And you, like, you know, that's huge, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for, especially for Resi too. So that okay. pointed me in like regional SA and I was happy to hunt around there and look for some decent properties. Yep. And there was other like numbers I was looking at as well. Like I was looking at population data, crime data, stuff like that. Not too deep into them, 
mm-hmm. because I was like, I looked at the fundamentals a lot more. I value investor sort of style. And how are you making that data help you make a choice? Well, I didn't want to pick somewhere where they're going to burgle into my property mm-hmm. or like burn it down. Lots of arson. That'd be really bad. And my insurance would cost a lot more. Yep. So that was a figure there. Also like population data. Is it growing? Is it declining? You know, that. how many tenants do I have? Who, who are the homeowners? Mm-hmm. Who are not the homeowners? Who are the renters? So you know if people want three bedroom or one bedroom. So it gives you an indication of what to buy, what's sought after, what's not. Because when you go to sell the property, you want a homeowner to buy it. So it's an emotional buy. Mm-hmm. So you make a lot of money. But you also want it to be tenanted. So you've got to find a balance between the two. You know, if there's lots of students but not a lot of families and you're selling to families but you're trying to tenant to students, it's not going to work. Okay, so you've done all this research. You're now 18 years old. Yeah. You've got some cash behind you that you've been saving up very diligently since 14. Yep. You've now looked at all these spots that you thought, okay, no, don't want that. I want that. I know the yield I want. Like you've, you've got all your parameters set yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, parameters for sure. Yep. T- talk to me about the actual first purchase. Where was it? What did it cost? So it was down in Wyala. Yep. That was where I got my first one. So we went with a real estate agent and mm-hmm. we just drove around with him because we went down for the family holiday. So we had a car with us this time. Second one, we didn't have a car. So we just went with an agent. It was a different agent that are time. You, your brother and sister thinking like, why are we going to Wyala? Like, is this... A- oh, no, no. They all knew. They, yeah, they knew yeah. what the purpose was. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. They were in on it. But um, we drove around a couple, couple of properties. Some of them were great. Some of them weren't, you know, but they're going to show you everything. And this one was actually, they, they said it was off market, but they definitely showed us. So how off market is off market if they show everyone? Well, off market uh, as a former agent, I can tell you, yeah. it's, it's generally just when it's not listed on real estate. That's what com. I thought. Yeah, yeah. Now, had they shown many people this property? I don't know. Potentially. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I looked at it. I liked it, uh-huh. and it was a good price, and it had good tenant. Like we saw the tenant when we walked in. And when you say good price, what's a good price? Well, for sixty k, I wanted to not pay LMI, so I wanted to go above twenty percent. Yep. And I was like, all right, cool. So if I have sixty k, and the price for it was two hundred and five, I think. 210, 205, something around that margin. Yeah, so low yeah. 200s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I ended up negotiating down to 195. Mm-hmm. And I was happy with that. 60, 49 on that, not paying them LMI. And this is what, 2019, 2020? Yeah, it would have been like about two, two nine months, two years, nine months ago. Okay. Yeah. Yep. All right, so pandemic kicked in then? Yeah, roundabouts. Yeah, it would have been just around then. It was like 2021, so it could have been anywhere. Yeah. Okay. It was around September that I did that one. All right, so you negotiated the deal down by the sounds of things, a couple of yeah, tens of thousands. Yeah, and that increased my like, yield as well. Yep. So that was the aim. And, and what was the yield? So the yield was like 8.8 something, potentially. No, I reckon it might have been 8%, definitely in the 8%. It was in like point something. So, so you, you're below box, nine. <laughs> your box of eight was, tepi- uh, was definitely Oh, tepi- for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. And, and so you're renovating it. You, you're doing anything to it? or it's Well, just- I did do some initial repairs to it. So that's yep. why I think I was able to negotiate it down a little bit. Okay. Because I knew I had to do, and this is from very gross margins. Like I knew I had to probably do about ten thousand dollars of expenses. Yep. But that was like with huge margins of error, because I was like, well, if I get ten grand down, I can at least convince the agent. Oh, they've got to do this, so I don't want to pay that. So you know, if I only pay two and it's brought down ten, well, we're in the green by eight. So you know, happy days. Okay. And wh- where are you even learning that? Like, is that something Mum suggested? Like, hey, man. Lowball them a little bit. Negotiate. Oh, no, no. That's, that's me. That's you? <laughs> that's me. Yeah, quite the negotiator. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and so you... But I think that comes from siblings as well. Like you negotiate with your siblings to get stuff, especially as the eldest. I feel like, you know, fight with them a little bit, but also not... not not. I don't think I was much as a physical fight. Definitely was at times. Yeah. But like, you know, negotiate with your siblings to get what you want, manipulate them just a little bit. <laughs> so... <laughs> All right, so you, you've got the cash flow, you've got some discount, you, yep, yep. you're doing a little bit of work, and now you're rolling your sleeves, driving up there, doing it yourself? No, 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 property manager. Property manager? Yep. Okay, so you've outsourced the, the works. Yeah, for sure, because I know I'm not the expert to do that, and okay. I've got my own job and life to live. Right. So I want to be as hands-free off as possible, because I don't need to know all the legislation. Mm-hmm. I'll be, you know, decent, and if I need to look at it, I'll look at it. I'll have a basic understanding, so I'm not going to do anything too wrong. Okay. But if I have an expert there to do it, I'm happy to pay them. It's like $32 a week at most. So mm. cool. I'm happy to let them do it. Oh, I didn't mean the property management. I meant them um, actually doing the, the bits of work on the house. Oh, no, no, definitely. I got them to get the quotes for it and do all that as well. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So they um, they found like some tradie to go up there and do some roof slippers or something because there was like little leaks in it. Yeah. And we saw that when we inspected the property. We saw it on the ceiling. Yeah. There was okay. little leaks there. So we're like, all right, cool. We'll fix that. Put some insulation in there. Get that sorted. Do the roof up in the ceiling. And then it was a downpipe as well to solve that water issue as well. So for anyone thinking, all right, you've bought, 
But you've bought in regional SA for 200 grand. Mm. It's never going to grow. It's regional. What's you, you and I talked about this. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, they couldn't be more wrong, actually. <laughs> okay. So after, you know, given like two years, nine months, it's hard to say if each year it did this exact growth, mm-hmm. but about 50,000 per year it grew. So what's it worth now? So about? it's a, from core logic values. It was about, yeah. I think, 287, something like that. So it's gone up about 100 so. So that's pretty good. Hey, that's, that's very good. Yeah. I haven't done anything to the loan or anything, so I've just been paying it off P&I the whole time. Okay. And and the yield still about the same? Yeah, or yeah, yeah. yeah. Changed? Well, if I was to sell it now, the yield would be a lot lower because I'd want to make money on it. But I mean more so the yield on purchase. Oh, yield on purchase. That's I've grown. Increased, yeah, I've got about an extra grand in rent, so I increased it by $20 just like last um, lease review. Brilliant, mate. Yeah. Okay. And I didn't, interestingly enough, I didn't want to do 10 because I didn't want 500. I wanted 1,000. So, <laughs> so I went by 20. But, you know, you hear some increases of like 300, 100, some stupid numbers. So, yes, you know. I, I had one that I put up a hundred dollars a week recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was and if you're able to in that market, it's great. But mine, I wasn't able to, so I was happy with twenty. Well, and and you also need to, you need to make sure that you're, you're weighing up what the tenant can afford, but also the market affordability. Oh, and vacancy cost too. Absolutely. Like, that property needs to be making money yeah. for me to make money. Because like the the one that I did it with, uh, the tenant realistically, I probably actually could have got more for it on the open market. Yeah. But how much it would have cost me to actually relet it. Plus, these guys are great. They mm-hmm, take better mm-hmm. care of this than I do my oh, own yeah. home. Like, it's it's that, yeah. yeah you don't want to throw away a good tenant, that's for sure. Exactly. I've got gold tenants. Yeah. I think I've been very, very fortunate and blessed for that. Okay. Like, my two resi tenants, yeah. not even horror tenants. They're like gold star tenants. And that's fantastic. And to think how lucky I am, you know, 18, 19, I could have got absolute, you know, awful tenants and ruined my whole journey. No, I've got great tenants. A bit of due diligence in that. Not much, you know. I just, you know, as I asked them, oh, how are they? They're already tenanted when I bought them. That's another condition I have. I only buy them if they're tenanted. I never buy vacant. Why? Because I don't want to buy a liability. I don't want to buy something that loses money from day one. Okay. Like that's a hard rule I have. Same with the 8% yield. Mm-hmm. No, two hard rules I have. Like, I want, When you look through like realestate.com, mm-hmm. you can see if it says tenanted currently or whatever, or, you know, what the rent is. I'll work out, is it 8%? Yes or no. And then if it's a no, no, don't look at it. Then I'll look at you know, is it tenanted? Yes or no? No, don't look at it. And so it slims your choices down, but it makes it so you're getting quality. Okay. Do you, do you ever look at, um, oh, not do you, I'm sure you do. You, you pay pretty close attention to the vacancy rates? No, not really, because I don't have vacancy. So it's not a need for me to look at it a lot, but, you know, I consider it sometimes. Okay. okay. <laughs> I've never experienced it, so there's not a real need to look at it a lot for me. Well, talk to me about how property number one helped you get into property number two. Well, um, I was confident. I think that's what it was. Or more of an emotional thing, right? I was like, okay, cool, successful. I've got money in my pocket. This was when interest rates were great as well. Yep. So definitely more cash flow. Now, still cash flow, but not as much. Still good though. But number two, I was confident to buy again. And even more so, I was confident in the negotiations. This one I actually probably made more money off, in my opinion, because I bought, so they listed it for, I think it was around about 210 again. Mm-hmm. But then they wanted to, then I said, oh, no, I'll pay 175 for it. And it was a better property. <laughs> so I was like a bit, you know, low ball off. It. Yeah. I was like, okay, cool. 175. But then they came back. I was like, no, we want 190. And I was like, no, you can have one, 185. And it was just same finance conditions, um, building and pest inspection conditions again. Mm-hmm. Um, this time I had a different building inspector though, because the last one was too hard to contact, especially because it's regional. Yep. So having a good team down there to be able to inspect stuff was important for me on number two. It is much harder building a good regional team. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people that just kind of clock in, clock out, nine to five. They don't really love what they do. Mm. And if you don't work with people that love what they do. Oh, no, I'm very lucky with Jim. He's, he's a good building inspector, that's for sure. Like, yeah. He's <laughs> gold star. <laughs> he does it really good. I've used him for all the, all the other three. And he'll probably have every other property if that's ever in that area, you know. Brilliant. Okay. You so uh, where'd you get the deposit from? You saved it? Yeah. yeah. So I just saved another 6K. That's really it. Cause I had the 20 roughly from the last one that I didn't use fully. Right. Okay. Yeah. And obviously your savings habits hadn't changed. You're no, not like, no, not at all. I've kicked the goal now. And I, I didn't take it. from the other property either. The property, it's much like the other savings accounts or mm-hmm. the expense accounts, right? I don't touch it. It's its own, it's, its own entity almost without, you know, talking about structures. It's its own entity, right? I can't take from it. Mm-hmm. I could, but I won't. It's its own being. Let it have its money. Let it make its money. I can skim off the top, mm-hmm. but enough to keep it alive. Talk to me about the biggest challenges that you had and how you had to overcome them. I reckon I definitely being 18, purchasing the first one, that was really hard. Number two, I didn't have a, I had to find that new team. 
Yep. I had to get a new building inspector and it was property number two. So it was a lot more negotiation back and forth in those ones. Like the commercials, I was f- buying the first commercial I ever had purchased on number three. Yeah. And it was a different market. Like, you know, commercial isn't the same as resi. You learn mm. in resi how to do commercial, but it takes a different sort of investor to look at it and see the value in it. And I think a very old in years, but young in f- like face, I think. <laughs> like I looked at it and I was like, okay, cool. I'm like an old man. You know, I want the yield for it so I can retire. So when I looked at the net yields on the commercial, I was like, oh, wicked. Mm-hmm. Cool, I'll have that. And changing my mindset from a gross yield to expenses and all that and knowing that mm-hmm. and tenants vacancy and whatnot, it just changes your mindset to, okay, cool. The property's not important as much now. It's more so the tenant's important mm-hmm. for the commercial one. That's where my value is. Like if you get a blue chip McDonald's tenant, you know, that's going to cost you a lot. Mm. Whereas, yield's going to be a lot lower. Oh, for sure, yeah. So you, your mindset shifts. You can't have an 8% if you're going to go that way. You can get to 8% with good tenants still, but that's a challenge in itself, right? Mm-hmm. So on my fourth property, I got a um, optometrist on, it's a dual shop front for both properties. Um, the first one was a uh, air conditioning specialist. That's a national company. They mm-hmm. have a lot more in the Eastern States and they've got two that are in SA and mainly in the industrial areas, right? So it's a dual, dual shop front retail premise. They own both, or tenant both sides. Yep. That's about 19,000 a year Okay. in net rent. And that's after all outgoing. So triple net yield. And then the fourth property, you know, I had an optometrist on one side and I had a travel agent on the other. So the travel agent had the risk in it. Okay. And especially coming out of COVID as well. Mm -hmm. So I was like, all right, cool. Travel agent's there, optometrist there, but they've both been there for 60 years. 60 years? Yeah, 60 years. It was purpose built. So I actually have the original building plans for it. Yeah, right. Yeah. (laughs) As funny out as that is, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and so what, what gave you the confidence that they weren't going anywhere? Especially things like travel agents. It's not exactly an Travel agent booming. I have less confidence in. Yeah. But now that they've renewed their lease for an extra six years, I'm more confident in that now. Um, they're not going anywhere. Yeah. Because they actually do the um, regional airport stuff as well. So they stay there because the airport's there. And right. they make enough money out of that as well. So that's what they do there. And that's for the like, fly-in, fly-out workers a little bit. The optometrist, you know, they change hands because they... They, they go to another skilled optometrist who takes mm. over as a partner or something. And they're on the Air Peninsula too. So there's lots of optometry of the same company on Longmare. So you, when you're giving good hands, answers, mate. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so something that I'm thinking now though is, is you just said one of your rules is I don't buy vacant because mm-hmm. you look at that as like a risk mitigation. Absolutely. Yep. J- just, just a quick note on that. If you, you do really see the vacancy rates are tight and mm-hmm. the chance of getting a tenant is really, really strong. A little tip: You can actually negotiate into the settlement clause. Oh yeah, that you can actually show the the property, so yeah, you yep. can still make sure that you don't actually have any holding costs. Oh yeah, I know that one. Yeah, that's a that's a good, good. idea. Yeah, good. and if I ever had to consider that, that's something I put in there. Yeah, good, like good. even on the commercials, I put in the due diligence clause. Yep, and that's another one. You know, you don't hear about that one a lot in resi, but you use it a lot more in commercial. Absolutely, but the reason I bring it up mm. is because the risk of losing a tenant in commercial and finding another tenant in the vacancy. Uh-huh. It's, it's much higher sure. if the asset's not selected correctly. I'm trying to understand what gave you the confidence to go, no, I don't buy vacant, but here I'll buy something that could potentially stand vacant for years. Because I want to, at least then you've got the income to mitigate some of that risk. So you have some of that holding cost already in the property itself, right? Okay. Like if I've got the 19,000, this is an example, and the other one's 34,000 because it's two tenants. Yep. So, and it's a bigger property worth more and they're better tenants as well. Like, One's an optometrist and the other one's an air conditioning specialist, you know, chalk and cheese. So okay. optometrist is a bit more high value. You can charge a bit more. Now, if I had that first year income and I have the profit from that, which is, you know, the vast majority of that 13000 is from the commercials, I'd say probably more than half, mm-hmm. especially with interest rates now. And what kind of value are we talking purchase-wise on these commercials? So the whole portfolio is a million dollars. Yep. And it splits as one ninety five for the first property. Second property is one eighty five. You're talking purchase or current value? Purchase. Purchase. Purchase, yeah. purchase yeah. for these ones. Yep. Um, and then the second, oh no, sorry, the first commercial was 210000 And then the third, oh, fourth commercial, fourth property, second commercial, yeah, that yeah. one was four hundred and ten. Okay. Yep. And and so where's the deposit coming from? Are you pulling out equity or how are you so expanding? So the third commercial, oh, third property, I keep calling it third commercial. It's definitely <laughs> so a we'll third We'll just go property. with rental property. Yeah, yeah. Easy. Anyway, so that one was our own savings. So we yep. had saved up from the second property onto that so our, who's our? Oh, my brother and I. So we went halves in this purchase. So okay. the story goes, and it's a funny story as well. Mm. It was like a summer's day, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'm really painting a picture. Yeah, I'm really painting a picture. Because okay, yeah, yeah. it was around Christmas time, right? Yep. And I was joking around with my brother Jack. I was like, hey, we could buy a property together because he had more savings than me at this point. And he's younger than you. Yeah, by 13 months. Yeah. Right. Okay. Radically the same age. Yeah. And he was like, oh, yeah, I'll buy one with you, Max. Because he knew I'd just buy it and he'd get the money, half the money from it. Yep. I just use his money for saying, like his little piggy bank, really. That's what I'm using him for. So and he's happy to be that piggy bank. You're putting together a JV with your brother on Christmas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, around Christmas. Yeah, around yeah, yeah. Christmas. It went through Christmas. Okay. And I literally come up to him on the lounge room couch and I put it in front of his face. I'm like, with a um, phone, I was like, commercial.com, whatever it is. Commercial, real, yeah, yeah, real commercial. Yeah. Yep. Put that in front of his face with the listing of the property. And I was like, hey, you want to buy that? And that was that. And he was like, yeah, I'll buy it. And we then put, put it in offer that day. He's a pretty easy JV partner. Yeah, because I already did the due diligence, like just initial stuff. And I was like, I'm happy with this, Jack. If we buy this, I'll like we can do it. Where are you learning property, uh, sorry, commercial property due mm. diligence? Because that's a whole other level. Well, I read the Rethink Investing book. Yep. So that was the start of it. Okay. And then there was like a Helen Torrant book as well that I read. I can't remember. That was like Unicorn Property or something, I think it was called. Yep. Um, and then I think Steve... Police, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I read, read something, Steve's book. I read one of his. I got the free one, of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so the, I read those three and they were pretty good from there. And I've watched all the podcasts as well for those. Okay. So you, you're really doing your research. You're getting as much education as possible, free education mm -hmm. where you can as well. And, and you're just pulling the trigger, mate. Yep. Because if you don't pull the trigger, you're not getting anything. You got to do something to get something. I, you, you're you're an impressive young man, Max. Thanks. Um, so next, I, I wanted to talk to you about after your first two rentals then, going into the commercial side of things, mm. I, I'm understanding like how you've done it now, the, the, the due diligence side of things, but why not just stick with what you knew? Why not just keep expanding in Resi? Well, I did actually do the um, feasibility on that, right? Mm -hmm. So I had the goal of getting to like, I think it was $3 million in gross asset value, right? That's what I wanted, not excluding all loans. That's just what I wanted to have. And what are I, you at now? 1.2 gross asset, roundabout, right? It might go up in that time. Yep. And then I'd sell that and I could have 1.2. No worries, easy. But if I wanted to grow to 3, point, oh no, 3 million, mm -hmm. I would have a revenue of certain X number. Mm -hmm. So I worked that out and, you know, it's a good number, right? So that's where I looked at the resi and I was like, okay, maybe if I have 100,000 net income, from 3 million, I think that's what it was, something like that. Sure. And that's because there's a lot more cost in resi, right? Yep. So your yield is great for gross, but your net yield is, you know, not good. Mm. So commercial really speeds that up a lot. To be fair, if you've got an 8% gross yield, your net yield's still not bad. It's not bad, no, <laughs> no. But but my standards are a little bit higher, I think. So I, I cut myself short on that bit where I was like, well, 5% is not great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. it's, it's not good, you know. Mm -hmm. When you can get better, it's... You know, I don't want to be too risky and go for like silly numbers Yep. because then you run the risk in other areas. But I still wanted to have a decent 8% yield. If I do this, if 12 properties, there's a lot of properties to have. Yep. That's a lot of management costs. That's a lot of this cost. I'm on the phone all the time then. You know, the commercials run themselves pretty much, same as the resis because I've only got two and they're easy tenants. But you run the risk with harder tenants the more properties you have with resi. The commercial ones, they run themselves. They fix it themselves you know, other than the building and certain things, but they do a lot of it themselves and a lot of the cost is on them. So my net okay. yield is a hell of a lot better in commercial. So my portfolio goals will be achieved faster. So you started looking at it as a quicker way to get to where you wanted For to sure. go. Yep. hundred percent. Yep. Okay. All right. I, I can teach you a few different things later off air mm. as, as far as like not being on the phone all the time when you do start growing that portfolio as well. We've got 10 and I can tell you I'm not on the phone every day. It, <laughs> it does, doesn't work that way. But but um, I can see where you're going. Where yeah. You're wanting to be more hands off with your growth. Mm, mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, not with your growth, with your management. Yeah, yeah for sure. And yeah. I've achieved that with my four at the moment. Yeah. And I'm happy to go to number five and hopefully still have that same. But commercial mitigates a lot of the potential to be having to fix things a lot of the time. Like Resi has a lot of silly repairs you have to do. Yes. Commercial, that'll do it themselves. They won't even tell you if they're fixing something sometimes, mm -hmm. unless it's like too big, right? All right. For, for anyone that's going, okay, cool. You've, you've pulled the trigger. Yep. You're, you're obviously a doer, but, but now it's like, are, are you going to keep growing with savings? Are you going to start using equity? Like what's the plan to move forward? Well, the commercials make enough profit where it's feasible with another few properties potentially to have it so that they're actually creating their own deposits in a self-sustaining, like little little machines making property deposits. Okay. That's the that's the next goal as well, to have little property deposit makers. 
So you're not taking any of this money and going sick, I've earned this, oh, let's no, go buy buying. a new car. No, hell no, no. No. I still drive my same car. A little Holden 2004 Astra. <laughs> okay. Gets around really well. Love no it. worries. A to B. Talk to me about sacrifice then, mate, because you, you must, is you, you're missing out on your, your younger years. Oh. Like, how's, how's it working? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> nah. Like, I've had a, I always budget myself a holiday each year. Yep. Um, that was since I was 18, because now I'm able to do things a bit more independent. Okay. Um. First one I did was skydiving. That was pretty good. That was with one of my mates. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Then we, same mate went did um shark cage diving at Port Lincoln. That sounds terrifying. Yep. No and we went to Coffin Bay as well, so that's less terrifying. Okay. But, um, no, we saw three sharks on that day. It was really good, actually. I flagged that, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you're still doing stuff. Oh, yeah. And then we went on a cruise just last year in November as well. That was on a work trip too. One of my mates came up to Sydney for that. All right. Wh- what about general weekends? Like, Well, I don't drink. Um, you don't drink? Okay. Don't. I don't want to do clubbing or anything like that because that's sort of hand in hand. Um, that's not to say that if my all my mates went and if it was really fun and, you know, it was reasonably safe, you know. It's not that fun if you're not drinking. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So, like, we do different parties. We do, like, Secret Santa. We do, like, birthday parties with each other and whatnot. We did go-karting last year, like little Mario Kart sort of thing like we are talking about off air. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So do you feel like you're sacrificing? No, because I enjoy it. Like, if I'm having fun doing it, and I can just pay for my own fun if I want it. Like, there's no limit to how much fun I could have. I could, you know, if I wanted to do something, I can do it. That's the thing. So I just I just don't do it for the, I don't do it because I have to. I do it because I want to. So if I want to do something, like I wanted to go skydiving, mm-hmm. I just went skydiving. I paid for it, done. Set it in the, and then I put away the expense for it. Yep. So I divide the cost of skydiving by 52. Boom, go do it in 52 weeks time. <laughs> or, you know, you could divide it by 12 if you want to do it in 12 weeks. What experiences do you think you you might look back on in maybe your 30s or 40s and mm. go, yeah, actually, I, I probably didn't do that, and that would have been fun? I don't know yet. <laughs> so there's nothing that you feel that you're you're going, yeah, okay, I do do these things, but there are all these other things that, yeah, I could do, but I'd rather do this. Well, I try and self-medicate it before it becomes a problem because I, sometimes I do feel like in the week I'll be like, oh, damn, I haven't had seen any friends for a while, and I'll say it to mum, and she'll be like, well, go see your friends then. <laughs> like, you know, make time for them. Otherwise, you're going to lose your friends, right? So, true. you know, sometimes I have to kick myself in the butt and get it done. Because you're working pretty big hours. Yeah, exactly right. So, you know, I'm lucky I have certain days off, so like my Thursday, Fridays, you know, they're my days. Yep. And on the Fridays, I go out with mum. So, you know, I keep family a very important part of that. So I have a Friday with mum. Easy, you know. I can go out for a coffee with her or whatever. Thursday, I volunteer with um, like aged care. Mm-hmm. And so that keeps me with the community as well, volunteering, like it's good for you as well. And you get a lot of experience from those old people too, if they're, you know, still mentally well. Hold on a second. So you didn't tell me any of this before. Oh, um, no. <laughs> so you're going to what, a nursing home? Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. So I volunteer in aged care on Thursdays. Um, so I do like a three-hour shift there because it's my um, day off. And then um, I've met a 90, no, no, before that I had a lady who, because you do individual visits in their rooms sometimes. Yeah. Some of them aren't as able. So the first lady, she wasn't as abled. And I do bingo first for about an hour. Uh-huh. Then I go for two hours, just individual visits. And some of them you get along really well with. Some you like really, really get along with. Those ones you go for individual visits in their rooms, right? So there was this first lady, Bonte. She's unfortunately passed now. But, um, you know, they get old. So you have to expect that at some point. That's part of the job. Mm-hmm. And it's sad. And, you know, that hurts. But there's no shortage of people in those homes as well. So you, you do just have to find new friends eventually. When you have that relationship with them, they have so much life advice as well. What's a standout? Well, so like the guy I see now, John, his wife passed away recently. Mm-hmm. And they just have a bit more wisdom in them, right? So I've never seen a man so sad before. And it just puts you in perspective as well. Like every, anything going bad in your life, it can't be that bad compared to some of the things that happened later on in life. Like he had been with his wife for 60 plus years mm. and then she passed. And because she, she had dementia, she was sort of forgetting him near the end as well. So it was, she had, you know, died a little while ago, essentially. But he had that retrospective look at it and he said to me, you know, something she said was live life each day like it's your last. Well, that's important, right? A 21-year-old might not think that in every aspect of their day. But because I have them on the Thursdays, they remind me of that more each time I go in there, that you need to live life in the moment right now because you are in the moment right now, you know? How does that change what you do? Because I can't help but mm. think as much as it's, it's uh, I don't want to take away from anything you've achieved, mate, because it's, mm. it's nothing short of amazing. But it's not all in the moment. 
Some of it is like you got to think positive about what you're doing. Like you got to find the motivation to do things too. Like making those spreadsheets, it's not. I could procrastinate as much as I want to do something more fun. I could go see my friends instead. But in the moment, I know that the future value of this is a lot more. So they put that in perspective in some other quotes they have as well. Like, I feel like you've really changed the lens in which you view the world through. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I'm getting to that point. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I think I'm a bit wiser having brushed with some very wise people as well because they're near the end of their years. So they've got a lot of life experience too. Mate, there's uh, it's something I've never actually done on the show before. I'm going to give you a copy of my book because whilst you're already on your way to being an absolute mm. superstar investor and you already are a gun for what you've done, oh, thank you. there'll be a few things you can pick up from this. But I've also included a little gift voucher in there, mate. I've, I've never actually given anything away like this on the show before because – Go and have something fun. Okay, it's 300 bucks, flight Ooh, center. Oh, thanks, Todd. It's all right, mate. I, I am so... <laughs> Got to find somewhere to go now. <laughs> well, the missus and I booked Bali not long ago for 300 yeah, bucks. Right, so if you okay. look on Jetstar... You, you I have can, seen. They come up in my emails. <laughs> yeah. But the reason I wanted to do this... Yeah, I appreciate that so much. Thanks. Thank you. That's all right. Is to give you some advice that you didn't ask for. Mm. I've had the privilege of speaking to some of the most successful people in the country mm -hmm. doing this job. And, and I'm very, very humbled to be able to do that. Oh, yeah. Some of the things that I've learned off air in this job, though, is you can't ever buy back your youth. Mm -hmm. And whilst there is no part of me that wants you to stray from what you're doing, because I think it's it's, it's incredible, mm. there are certain things that I think make sure to still balance it with a little bit more of what makes you happy. But it doesn't mm. doesn't sound like you completely sacrifice it, mate. But I yeah. I think I want to. Force the happiness a little bit. <laughs> a little bit, but also reward such yeah. a wonderful human being. Yeah, like thank you. Yeah. you. You're doing such a good thing, mate. And and I know that if you and I sit back in this room together in five years' time. Fingers and toes. Yeah, we're, we're going to be talking about a, a five, ten million dollar portfolio probably. Yeah, look, probably. <laughs> yeah. If I'm going the way I am now, I should be right. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, what I wanted to, to start wrapping things up with, mate, is your action step. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For anyone that's listening now. And they're thinking, geez, I'm inspired by this dude. Mm -hmm. What's something that they can pull out the headphones right now and, mm -hmm. and get to work on? I think educating yourself is important. Mm -hmm. So you need to figure out what investment class you want to go into. For me, I didn't like shares because they didn't give me the return I wanted. So I moved on to the next best thing, property. Cool. It's a bit conservative as well. Shares, yep. you can be quite conservative if you want to. And like, I think when I look at back at it, I went from really conservative compound interest. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you're not keeping up with inflation. Shares, you can keep up with inflation, but it's still quite conservative with dividends and whatnot. That's where I was playing. Mm -hmm. And then property, I wanted frequency because I like the passive side of shares, but I didn't get frequency of income that I wanted. And also you can leverage property a hell of a lot better. So I think if you lean towards property, that's great. So not everyone has to lean that way. Some people don't lean that way. Mm -hmm. But if you go into property, resi, there's a lot more cost. So I think definitely don't say no to resi, but don't say no to commercial either. I think you've got to look at a very open mind view of all the investment things. If, if I can kind of focus the action step then, if, if I've understood yeah. you right, get educated on your options. Yeah, correct. Yeah, definitely look at your options yep. because there's no one right way to do things. Just because I've done it this way doesn't mean someone else is going to do it the same way. I think if you followed what I did, yep. you'd be very fortunate and probably go correct on that same similar path, right? Not the same path because mm -hmm. there won't be the same properties to buy. Mm. You know, you can't do everything exactly the same. And when I look at those role models in the books and whatnot and the podcast, you know, even like yourself, right? You know, you've done a lot of stuff with your portfolio. Mm -hmm. I won't be able to replicate some of that. Mm -hmm. I could replicate some of it, but not all of it, right? Yep. So I take the little bits that I like and use that for myself. I won't take everything. I like it, man. Well, arguably the most important question of the entire show. I've been waiting so long for this. <laughs> <laughs> you know how long I had to think about this question? <laughs> well, I'm, I might... Assumption is you're going to say some kind of a burger pizza, like hence being, being a, oh, you're, you're so sitting in far front of me the with a McDonald's hat on. Like, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, Max Jennings, yep. what is your favorite pizza? Vegetarian pizza with pineapple. We are oh, with pineapple. With pineapple. I wanted to break someone's heart with we, that. We yeah. were friends up until now. Yeah. <laughs> but if I had to be a McDonald's brand ambassador, <laughs> <laughs> I'd say a Big Mac pizza. <laughs> or, no, I, actually, they did a McPizza, didn't they? I think at one point. I've it's actually made, made one of those before. Yeah. It actually tastes pretty good, but you yeah. got to make sure to put the lettuce on later. Don't. Yeah, put no, don't put it on and cook. No, no, no. That's rubbish. Much. Yeah. Okay, so a, a vegetarian pizza with, with pineapple. Pi where are you getting it from? Ah, uh, just a local joint. I don't know. It doesn't matter to me. So long as it's good. Okay. And, yeah, and you're vego picky. or you just enjoy that? Yeah, I am vego, yeah, but only recent, like maybe last two years or something. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. 
Good stuff, man. Well, look, thank you so much for taking the time to jump on the show, man. Yeah, thank you for having me, Todd. It's been great. Mate, it's my absolute pleasure. I can't say it enough. I'm, I'm so impressed with everything that you've done and I, I, I genuinely look forward to, to watching your journey into the future, mate. Awesome. Thanks so much.